Hello, everyone. How are you doing? It is Thursday, July 23rd. My name is Joel Ivany, and it's good to have you with us on this very special day. Today is the first day of Major League Baseball. Can you believe it? And I'm here with Sammy. Sammy's going to say a quick hi before hi. scooting off. Um, we learned that the S Seattle NHL team, they have a, an official name, the Seattle Kraken. And it's also my birthday. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Robin. Hi, Bob. If you're still there, it's good to see you. Thanks for watching. Um, a huge thank you to the Yukon Art Center all the way in Yukon who are sponsoring these chats that we are having and these opera pubs that we are producing. And so a big thank you to them. My, I have a joining me today and her name is Leela Gilday. And Leela, how are you? I'm great. Joel, how are you? It's so lovely to see you and happy birthday. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see you too. Thanks for agreeing to come on and <laughs> chat about life, about COVID, about music and all that stuff. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good to connect even over the internet. Yeah. Not, not too bad. Um, how about a safe, not a safe first question, but where are you, where, where are you sitting right now? Where, what part of the world are you in? Well, I'm in my office, um, where I do all of my rehearsing and producing and, um, administrating of my music career, uh, here in Denende, which is, it, uh, where I am at is on Treaty 8 territory, Keicho territory, that's the Willaday people or the Yellow Knives Dene um, in Yellow Knife Northwest Territories. Amazing. If I got this right, I think I'm on Treaty 13 and it is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Wendat. So it's nice that we can virtually meet over these treaties like that. So that's kind of cool. Oh, yeah. someone, we have. Already love the song One Drum. Should have been the theme song of the Vancouver Olympics. That's what Bruce Reed commented. So he's oh. seems to be a fan of yours. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thanks, um, Bruce. <laughs> I have a, I guess a first question for you is um, someone asked how, someone asked how we met. How, how did we get connected? And I, I can start a little bit of that. Oh, Sophie's watching. She loved watching Leela at Banff last summer. Sophie, she's a cellist and she was there as well. Um, I flew up to the Northwest Territories, flew up to Yellowknife just to see a part of Canada that I had never seen before. And a mutual friend now of ours connected us together. And what, what was your experience of, um, how hesitant or open were you then when you got connected that way? Well, I thought it was really, unusual that someone would just fly up to Yellowknife and with no real um, friends at the time, um, although you were connected through, I think, through Kyla's roommate to Kyla or something like that. And um, and Kyla said to me, uh, Kyla Cackley Scott uh, said to me, this guy from Toronto who's an opera guy is coming to Yellowknife and I know you're a musician. Would you like to meet him? And I was like... <laughs> Yeah, why the heck not? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, you know, it didn't seem, it seemed like you were a whimsical person and maybe just wanted to kind of, um, she didn't give me too much background on the decision that motivated you to do that. Um, and so I was really pleasantly surprised when we sat down and had coffee and um, you essentially explained to me that, it was sort of uh, inspired by the can the the sesquicentennial of uh, the celebration of Canada's 150th birthday, um, that you were curious about the history of Canada and not just as a settled nation, not just settlers, but with regards to the relationship with Indigenous people. And so, this was you know your journey to kind of uh, self-educate and really connect with. Um, indigenous people across the country and particularly in the north and um, I thought that was I was quite moved by your quest to um, put yourself out there 
And so I, I, yeah, I mean, it could have gone any way, <laughs> but until I knew it was you, <laughs> but it yeah. turned out to be you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being open to that. I think, um, I think myself, along with many other Canadians at the time, um, had a difficult time sort of understanding and believing what, what Canada meant to us uh, from what we had been educated um, to what my education of what Canada was and knowing that there were some huge gaps and um, huge lies and um, huge things that I didn't know um, and to hear it from an Indigenous artist and person was um, very eye-opening and very humbling. So again, thank you for being open to having coffee then, all those years back now. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was truly my pleasure. I think it's really important that uh, non-Indigenous people, um, you know, particularly white settler, I use the term settler as uh, it's kind of referring to, you know, people who not who weren't originally from this territory. Um, I think it's really incumbent on you to do things like that, to self-educate, to um, to be proactive in include in things like diversity and inclusion, and really trying to understand um, other people from other cultures, and you know, in my case, Indigenous people, and the history that this country is built on, and not the one that you were taught in school. Yeah in my nice safe school unlike unlike many of the schools that the government set up but um kind of weaving a, a, around that a little bit um how have you been cast uh how have you been passing this covid time we've been in this pandemic now for i kind of go by the the length of the time that my son is now 16 weeks old and it was two weeks oh, wow. before that so <laughs> it's yeah. like almost four months that we've been in this how how has the time been for you in uh, Yellowknife? It's been both fast and slow. Um, the first month was like a roller coaster. It was terrifying. Um, and uh, actually, I shouldn't say like a roller coaster because some people find roller coasters exhilarating, but I didn't find it exhilarating. I mostly just found it terrifying. Um, kind of just watching all of the plans that I had made um, you know, cause I just released a new record, my fifth record in, um, September. And so we had toured, uh, we had showcased to plan out this whole long tour and I kind of just saw the gigs fall down one by one yeah. by one by one, just cancel. It was like dominoes and, um, yeah. And then, you know, by the end of March, all of my, most of my summer gigs have been canceled by the end of April. All of them had been canceled by the end of May. My fall gigs and winter gigs had been canceled and things into 2021. So it was just a period of trying to reinvent myself. And, um, you know, I dove pretty deep inside. Like I wasn't very, um, I wasn't writing music a lot um, because I, because I feel I need, there's like a generosity of emotional spirit that I need to be able to, produce music and I was in kind of survival mode. So I got through that period and I kind of set up this home studio that I have now. And um, yeah, I, I've been uh, really reimagining myself to reach audiences online. Oh my God, my first like couple of online performances were just a gong show. Like I didn't know the tech, was, the tech setup was one thing like all of a sudden I'm I've never been a great technician so here I am like running the lights and the sound and and trying to like be clever like put on a good performance do be clever in the banter and interact with people online and oh I was just exhausted <laughs> like one of the show took a week to produce beforehand anyway um yeah and then so but since then things have gotten a little smoother and I've really appreciated interacting with fans in a very intimate way. Um, it, I actually was more nervous for my online performances in the first uh, couple of months than 
I have been in years for any of my actual live shows. So yeah, it's been a real adjustment. I, and you know, the one benefit is that I get to be home with my family. It's the longest time that I've been home in, in 20 years, uh, continuously. Mm. So, so that's been, um, that's been a benefit. And, you know, I was exhausted before we kind of run ourselves into the ground as artists and we're consistently um, sacrificing our mental health and our physical well-being for the show because the show must go on. But uh, but this has really given me a, an opportunity to take stock of that and and to try to like really own my workaholism and um, hmm. really address the balance that needs to happen in my life. And yeah, it's been really good. Oh, good. Um, how is for those of us who aren't in Yellowknife right now, how is it with COVID there? Is Are people wearing masks? Are, are people social distancing? How, how is sort of the everyday life, how is that transformed? Or t like now, how is that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I've been wearing a mask outside. I've been quite cautious. Um, and partially because like my parents are in the higher risk group, you know, they're in their seventies. Um, but also, and I'm quite close with them. Um, but also because I'm, I've just been following the recommendations of our chief public health officer. She's been doing a great job. We have no cases in the Northwest territories, knock on wood, um, and hoping to keep it that way because our population is quite vulnerable. We have a lot of elders. We have, many remote communities with very little healthcare infrastructure, um, you know, a communities with maybe one nurse or a, or a medic or a fly in doctor once a month or whatever. Um, so, so it's really important that the virus not make it up here. And so our borders are still closed right now. If you come up, you have to, and you're not a resident, you have to have an exception letter. And wow. yeah, it's, I'm actually just trying to get an, an exceptions for my brother and his family to come up uh, to visit us next week because it's been since Christmas so uh, that my parents have seen them. So, and that's been challenging, but I, I totally get it. Like I, um, this is, this, this virus is a huge specter and I, I, I just dread what would happen if it did hit the North. And in fact, I'm just very grateful that we've had, you know, uh, a CPHO that's been so proactive. She's been, she was one of the first to close our borders. Um, she re really recognizes, she's really, really smart. And she really recognizes, um, you know, that, that our populations are very vulnerable. Um, that being said, there's a lot of people who have just returned to normal and are just like walking around, shaking hands, yeah. you know, just all of the stuff that you're not supposed to do. But um, yeah, I, for myself, I try to follow the guidelines as, as much as possible. Good. good She's taken good. a lot of flack for this. Like the, recently, um, our CPHO has, has received quite a bit of criticism, um, for, for the strict guidelines still, but I, you know what, we've all been told there will be a second wave and yeah. it only takes one person to create like a like uh to to be exposed and then spread that so yeah I, i'm i'm in favor of strict guidelines same i think that makes sense and is good and yeah you have to trust those who are there so yeah um okay well, moving on into something a little more um exciting so to speak um i know a little bit of how you got into singing but how how did you get into singing what was sort of your path and how how was that connected with either classical music or what we think of as classical music? Yeah. Um, yeah, I I feel like I was born singing. Um, my, <laughs> my dad is a musician. My mother is a great lover of music and they both raised me from a, like a very small, like a baby singing. Um, I remember my first record that I loved was like the instruments of the orchestra. And I learned how to identify each instrument just by its sound, you know, like 50 instruments or something. And, and so just like 
um, growing up in a musical household, uh, it was as natural as breathing. And so when I got to kind of um, high school and decided what I wanted to do as an adult, I thought music school would be fun. So I went to uh, University of Alberta and I, and I studied um, I, I studied classical music. So I, I majored in voice and did quite a bit of opera uh, while I was there. And then, of course, leader and art song and all the other good things in the syllabus. And uh, yeah, I, I really, um, I loved singing classical music. I loved singing opera. I, I definitely felt inspired um, with the kind of rigorous training and the rehearsal scheduling. Like I, I, to this day, credit my chops with, you know, that four year period in my life where I had, I was not required, but encouraged to rehearse, you know, between one and five and four hours a day. Like it was, it was music school. Everybody did it. So it was, yeah. uh, you know, a wonderful time where I really got to know my voice. I got to know my instrument in a, in a much more intimate way than I, than I had. And yeah, I, I um, loved opera. And when I graduated, I had planned to, go on and do and continue my education and get a master's uh, still remaining in performance because I was drawn to that. Um, but I took a year off and in that time I started playing guitar and I realized that the music that I was singing um, was not expressing my inner creative voice um, and my story, my unique story in this world, which is I'm from the North, I'm Dene, I'm a woman, and many of the operas that uh, I was singing and much of the music that I was singing was written by, you know, European men long dead. And um, yeah. not to say that there aren't some great contemporary operas because there are, um, but I wasn't singing those. And so for me as a creative, um, to express that creative voice, I uh, turned to songwriting. And so I kind of took a detour and that has become my life. So I, I, I mentioned I just released my fifth record. So, yeah, I, I really, um, I, I love my, my classical training and my uh, time spent um, exploring opera and learning opera and training in opera. Um, and I'm glad that I did that. And I, um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed the work that I've been, that I've done with your company as well. I, I really have loved being involved and uh i i feel like i'm as a singer uh i i'm always m mostly inspired by other singers like i love all kinds of music but to me the human voice is like our birthright and so i love just being um in a room with you know fine singers and just being blown away by the vibrations and by the art and just the the skill so um bruce seems to be a fan of yours he said the classical training shows and how true your voice really is so that's kind of very cool to hear um best day also tuned in and she's it's like a flashback to bamp for her so oh, she says hello hi, as well how are you? oh yeah. i miss you it's so nice <laughs> that it, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome um, oh, I'm seeing when, comments now. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, some of them. Yeah, Michael's going to throw some of them up. Um, um, when you were a kid, you moved for how long? You came to Toronto, didn't you? Yes, I. Uh, <laughs> when What's that I was story? A kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, my, I don't know what I've. Ne this blows me away. Like to this day, thinking about it as an adult. Um, because this was crazy. Like I was in grade seven and I think on a whim auditioned for the Toronto Children's Chorus. And I, I sent a tape, like a cassette tape. Um, I recorded me singing some folk song and I sent this cassette tape in and I got into the Toronto Children's Chorus. And so my family, my dad took a sabbatical from his job as a music teacher and my mom got a job that would enable her to work. She's um, an environmental and indigenous rights activist. So at that time she was working with the um, Indigenous Survival International 
out of the Chiefs of Ontario office. We moved from Yellowknife. We leased our house for a, a year, moved to Toronto for a, a year. Like my entire family, my brother, my sister, myself, and my parents, we all like drove in our suburban down to Toronto. And I remember I was so, oh, it was such a big city. I was really uh, shell shocked because I'm from Yellowknife. So, um, and yeah, I sung with the Toronto Children's Chorus for a year. And that's where I, um, you know, got to sing in Roy Thompson Hall and with the symphony and with uh, the Mendelssohn Choir and all of that really good stuff. That that doesn't happen. I haven't heard too many stories like that. That's a pretty right? unique one. Yeah, I I am blessed to come from a family that has always supported my musical endeavors and that, you know, would do anything to support me. And that's, uh, I've definitely, I think in my younger years, maybe taken that for granted, but as an adult, I, um, I realize how special that is. That would have been very, did, do you think the people in the choir, like the other choristers, did they sort of understand how epic that was and sort of where, where you were from and, and what that meant or, or not really? I don't think so. No, yeah. we were just kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just kids. Yeah. Man. <laughs> we were just kids. Wow. I remember my, and my brother ended up joining the, the junior choir, like the training choir um because my brother's really great singer as well and um and i remember we had to take the subway by ourselves because we lived in we rented a house in etobicoke for the year so we had to take the subway from like islington to like saint andrew like king and yeah and uh, and get off there and then walk like a few blocks and like it was just the the most epic thing to like be traveling by ourselves and I think about it yeah. now I'm like, oh God. I was in grade eight my brother was in grade five like I don't know if I as a parent would allow my children to that. take it wow <laughs> anyway but those were different times like <laughs> that was and that just amazing. shows I, yeah I think how amazing <laughs> how amazing your parents were for you to experience this musical experience yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Um, we played in Carmina Burana and we did uh, Mahler's, uh, uh, what's the one with the children's choir? Was it, was it eight? I, I can't, I yeah. can't remember. Anyway, a Mahler, a big Mahler piece. And then um, I should have, I should have looked it up before I chatted with you. Anyway, there was lots of like really epic pieces that we did and I still, Every Christmas, I'm I sing that Benjamin Britten's uh, Christmas Carol. The <laughs> this little yeah. babe, the few years old, has come to a ripe old estate's fold. <laughs> it's like wow, really it's in there. Cute, like children's. Uh, anyway, yeah, I really, really loved my time there. And Jean Ashworth Bottle was very strict and very like scary, but also so amazing. Like she brought out, I think that maybe was where I really learned about vocal discipline to start with and then, you know, carried on through my training. So. Well, that kind of connects, that makes sense possibly, not possibly, but how you would um, go on to follow a more voice degree. And it's interesting that you said that again, you were studying opera, you were singing opera. Uh, Bruce, Bruce is on fire. He's wondering sort of what, what roles or what arias did you sing when you were in school? Um, oh, and it was Mahler's eighth. Bill, yes. Oh, who's with the Vancouver oh. back <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> there it is. There we go. It's is that my dad? I my head is blocking the title. So, yeah. Bill Gilday, is that your dad? Yes, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. So it got, yeah led to a classical music degree and then you said you found it difficult this artistic expression that you were sort of seeking um were there singers that you were looking up to or not looking up to was that a was that a, a challenge did did your who you were in your background did that ever come into play about are there other indigenous opera singers um did you ever question that or think about that 
Um, I mean, when I was at that time, really the only famous like indigenous opera singer was Kiri Te Kanawa, uh, the Maori um, mm. singer. And uh, but since then, there have there have become yeah. like there are more and more indigenous opera singers and and lots of incredible ones now that I know of. Um, but at the time, I didn't really think of that um, as a like a motivation for leaving opera. It was more or for like envisioning myself. I mean, I at, when I when I decided to start focusing on songwriting as my main creative act endeavor um, versus going the classical route or going to take a master's. Um, it was really about the, I had taken a composition class in my degree. If I was a great opera composer, I may have continued down that way as my yeah. method of expressing our stories. And, um, but I wasn't, I just wasn't gifted in that way. I'm, I've turned into a very good songwriter. Um, at the time, I wasn't a great songwriter, but I was at least able to say some of the things and convey some of the um, ideas and also the this kind of musical influences of my people um, through my through the music at the time. So, it, so that was far more attractive to me than sort of trying to fit myself into a mold. Although, had I been more um, like I said, inspired. It was more about the writing piece, I think, um, hmm. than necessarily the vocal expression. That's okay. That's kind of interesting as well. As as an indigenous artist and an incredible songwriter, as you said, incredible five albums, which is not easy to produce, to create, to write. So that's an an amazing feat in and of itself. You've you've been leading the way. Um, being very vocal of who you are and where you're from and mm -hmm. what does it what does the word equality when that sort of is brought up um what does equality look like for you as a musician as an artist that you know that's a tough question and i struggle with that word um because there because that kind of assumes that you want to be part of a system that already exists. Yeah. And so I think that that at the heart of it, and, I, and this is kind of my um, whole reaction to including the Black Lives Matter protests that have recently gotten mainstream notice, although they've been protesting for years and I've even participated in some Black Lives Matter protests, like couple of years ago I mean that's been happening since the civil rights movement like let's be real but I think mm -hmm. that when people think about equality um like we're talking about really really basic human rights and justice um and being recognized as a human being and being like allowed to have the dignity that every human being should enjoy um as an artist though equality means something a little bit different for me um, being an indigenous artist in this territory. Um, I think that uh, mostly it's about being recognized and, uh, and having our music be recognized as equally as important, if not more so than other artists that are operating in this country. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, yes, a, it's yes. kind of a difficult one. Like I, like we're not more important, but the way that this is where we live, like this is where our art form lives and where we are born, like where our history is, um, where our people have been for thousands of years, like for thousands and this is the only place so whereas like um, opera has its roots in europe and um like the birthplace of opera you can go there it's a physical place you can go and i'm not sure how thriving it is 
in those countries, but there is another place. It's there's no other place where indigenous music um, of the indigenous people of this country comes from. So, um, yeah, it's that's a that's a tricky one because of course, it until like UNDRIP is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is embraced by all levels of government and um, enshrined, you know, in constitutions, whether they be for like um, governing bodies or just organizations that social organizations, I think that we're going to be kind of playing catch up. So hmm. um, as an artist, it's really, it's a, it's actually a good time. Um, I think more and more people are listening to our voices and listening to our stories. And um, uh, as an artist, as an indigenous artist, like I have not just a responsibility, but also I feel inspired to share uh, my, our stories and, and the things that I believe in and, um, kind of give a window on um, on things that people may not necessarily have experience with or um, be able to touch people's minds and hearts in, in a way that will open them. Hmm. It's I totally went off on a tangent there, but. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's Debbie Delancey is watching as well. She says, hello. <laughs> she loves Hi, seeing Debbie. the two of us together. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's kind of um, growing up. It for me, it was um, there was always this label around Christian music, and it's just how come it how how come you need that label Christian? How come it just can't be music? Why does it have to be a specific? And mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the same as Indigenous artist, but um, mm -hmm. why can't it just be an artist? But then there's also, I think, as you were saying, this change happening where there's this authority um, in a very good way that you bring when with that word that you are an indigenous artist that like you said that you've you and your people have been here for thousands of years and mm -hmm. and it, i i connect i get that i get that 100 percent meaning you you have been here you are here and you will be here so it's kind of um why why can't the rest of the world or canada even sort of acknowledge and sort of come to terms with that but i th i think it's on its way it feels like it is more so than it has would you say or no yes i i think so the the cracks are the lights showing through the cracks and things i think are coming apart which is good um because i don't think that we can move forward the way that we have been moving forward and i'm not referring to you know like your and my relationship as indigenous and non-indigenous i think that we're moving in a very positive direction in that way. But I'm talking about governments. Like I'm talking yeah. about First Nations. I'm talking about land, which is at the heart of what we call reconciliation. Um, but yeah, I think people are becoming more aware um, of, of the things that, of our realities. And that starts with history. So, you know, the Re Truth and Reconciliation Commission I would say we're really just at the truth part and that's yeah. the first step. And so I feel like that's where we're at and, and the more truth can show the better. Like I think the pandemic has made people take stock of a lot of stuff and I'm hoping that, you know, not knowledge and self-education and um, really trying to address wrongs and injustices in in our society as well as towards our earth um are at the top of people's priority list you know again when they have a chance to think about it because normally we're so busy right yeah. um it's easy it's easy uh, if you're not friends with indigenous people like if you not to say that you know like i'm not talking about um, racism or, or anything like that. But if you just, in your social circle, if you don't have anyone that you love, that's an indigenous, that's an indigenous person or, or in your family, then even if you feel, um, impacted by things that impact us, or even if you feel sad or angry or, 
distraught or you don't know what to do, there is a point at which you can, at the end of the day, put that, turn off the TV or put that, your laptop away or like close that book and then just, you know, um, set it to the side. And as Indigenous people, we can't do that. So if you love someone, um, then that their, their heart matters become your heart matters. And that's, I think, what's happening in a way. So I think so too. But like you said, um, the truth of reconciliation that is only four or five years old that that sort of report mm -hmm. came out with nine, I think it's 94 calls to action. Um, and we have to be living that every, every day. And that's something you live that all the time, but yet that's mm -hmm. our responsibility to sort of own up to, like you said, government, um, all levels of government. Um, it's a lot of hard work and that's, that's what hopefully people are realizing during this pandemic is who's ready to continue putting in the time to make that happen. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, you and your company have done a really good job of, um, of taking that on yourself. Hey, we're talking and it's not even indigenous people's day. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're not like, oh, we have to get an indigenous person on indigenous people. No, you're just like, okay, we're going to have this everyday conversation, which is what they should be right like that's yeah. yeah so and and you know i i love that i don't know you you just you like to engage indigenous artists and art oh, even if you didn't get a grant for it you know like this is the this is it right this and that's the, the thing is yeah the government try tried and is trying to get everyone to think about it the right way like even grants like mm -hmm. you said um but that's you have to go about, I, I believe you have to go about this authentically and sort of, there's no faking it. So again, thank you for putting up for all the dumb questions and ignorant questions <laughs> I've asked over the years. And you've been so positive that way. Um, what could classical music and opera look like if it, what, and that may be, uh, this may be the wrong question, but like, what does indigenous opera look like or what, I believe that opera does have a problem. And so it's kind of like how, what are ways that it can be? Yeah. How do we, how do we fix opera? <laughs> you know, I, I really love this question because I think that there is a really great opportunity um, to, because I know that there have been a couple of like quote unquote native operas. And I know there are a few indigenous composers that uh, like Barbara Kroll who write works um, that could be staged. I think, you know, I don't know if that is something because opera is such a great art form. Um, and I love what you've done with it, like taking it into the pubs and really looking at it to, to spin it on its head and kind of refresh it in a way, because I still think there's a lot of value in it. And I, um, and a lot of heart and the potential to for like storytelling, incredible singing, um, yeah. beautiful music and communication. Um, it'd be su super cool to like involve indigenous opera singers in, you know, one of your uh, avant-garde productions of an opera. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I may be like the wrong person to ask, but I, but this is what, because I don't like, I'm not, once I left opera school, like once I left music school, I never went further down that road. So like my vocal development halted at the age of 21 <laughs> in that direction. I've gone in this, you know, singer songwriter direction and kind of, I, I'm really attracted to like soul singers. So and then um, in Dennis singing, like it's all about, it's very passionate and like all about putting your heart all out there. So it's, so technically I've gone in a different direction, but there are those um, people who've dedicated their life, like indigenous singers who've dedicated their life to opera. And I think it'd be super cool to stage a, a, an indigenous opera, uh, you know, and it doesn't even have to be on a huge heart-wrenching issue like 
Yeah. That's that's the other thing is like indigenous art. It's not just about talking about our issues, our society, like our friends and families and communities are so filled with um, it's multifaceted characters and like people and situations. And we're just like every other human community, you know, we're, there's lots of crazy stuff that goes on. And um, I, I think it'd be really cool to have like uh, on Canada reads a, um, one of my favorite authors, her book, well, it didn't win today, but um, her book, uh, Son of a Trickster is being, was, was discussed. I don't know if you tuned into that. I didn't catch it, but, but yeah, heard, heard about it. Yeah. So I would love to see an opera based on Eden Robinson's stories. Any one of her stories would be super cool. And that book is very, um, involves like spirit world and, on the show, they called it magic realism, which I'm not sure that I agree with, but because it's just kind of like the overlap of spirit world and like this corporeal world. So, um, hey, we're starting to talk like Copernicus territory. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I'm not sure. I feel like when you ask that question, like I feel excited by the possibilities and i think it'd be really really cool because i would like to think that opera could be a, a, a place or a world where singers like you that I, that you remove stigmas of what that even means and that word has a lot of stigma and um for many years it will still be um an issue in terms of i think someone was saying like there's a on instagram there's a feed that's called opera is racist and so it's kind of Right. If if we're working in an art form that supports those prejudices, then we got to knock those down. And um, I thought I've been telling people that I thought, like you said, that we were hoping that we could get more diversity in this prejudiced um, art form. Whereas I think what's more exciting to me is shifting that art form and being being something new so that. Mm -hmm. Like you said, uh, Dene singers, how, for, how do Dene singers, um, do, you, do they have voice lessons or is it simply, um, does that just come? Is it just um, what you well, do? Well, for traditional Dene music, like there's, I'm actually just writing an article on this for our Northern magazine, um, up here magazine, but there's three different kind of uh, forms of Dene, traditional Dene music. One is called Etsula. Um, that's then a love song. And that's usually sung by mostly women, sometimes men. And in in contemporary like situations, it's often sung at talent shows and it's very like teasing and funny. And but it also the form itself traditionally would be could be humorous, but also could express deep longing, grief, connection to the land. It could be magical. Could be um, about animals, could tell uh, the history of a place. Um, and then the second form is uh, is tea dance song, um, which is played, it's a just a, it's, it's sung by men. Well, it's sung by the entire community, but the form of the dance is you, it's side by side, you um, go in a circle side by side and it's sung, often men will, it's, it's sung without the drum. Um, and those are like older songs. I think the tea dance songs are older songs. And then there's the drum dance songs where it's, you know, the Dene drum is a hand drum, um, quite a large drum. Oh, hey. Here's my Dene drum. There you go. Um, wow. Let's see. I'm, I can't, I got to center it. Oh, there. It's beautiful. That's my, uh, my cousin. My uncle made this and then my cousin... Uh, did the art on it. I got this actually when I graduated from high school. Really? Um, but yeah, but usually women don't play the drum. Um, that's another whole conversation. But <laughs> anyway, young men are taught, young boys are taught to drum and sing um, from very young ages. So the 
they would join the men at drum dances and there's drum dances at every occasion you can think of like weddings, funerals, um, any community gathering, any community celebration. So um, at any given drum dance, there would be young drummers who are coming up and then they grow through the years and um, the outstanding voices and uh, leaders become clear just through experience. So, hmm. and then, you know, the community also sings the songs while dancing. Like it's not, um, it's not like a performance in the same sense as like a Western style performance, like of separation of audience and, and performer. So um, yeah, there's no like Dena drum or Dena singing lessons, um, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, I, I think just growing up around it and it kind of seeps into your blood right. and, uh, and that's definitely taken root in the music that I both write and sing. Well, I think what's beautiful about your music is how you blend both your, your tradition with innovation is how I like when you write songs, that's what it is. You're creating something out of nothing. And um, mm -hmm. your sound is both equally contemporary. I sound I sound like a professor or something, <laughs> but it's not that. It sounds like contemporary, but it's also rooted in this um, wisdom. And so I think that's what could be unique and possible for opera as well as how to mix, how to reconcile between these two, um, these two art forms as well, these two passions that you kind of, how do you write new music, but also stay rooted in, or not stay rooted, but bring that into it as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, at the heart of, of opera is this storytelling, like, um, yeah, you know, this, this, like, not just the libretto, but like the, the way the music is written, the way each part is written, um, you know, the characters sing in a certain way, they're like, significant motifs throughout and like that that can all um yeah be be brought into the into like an indigenous context for sure you i, I think you could i'm gonna we'll follow up with that later i think you could write an opera i, I think we can oh, yeah. we, we can figure it out how to write the music down debbie's i think debbie's on board she'd like to, she's like i'd love to see atg bring leela's vision to life in yellow knife and I know it wouldn't just happen in Yellowknife. All of Canada would love to hear what a Lila Gilday opera would sound like, I think. Well, let's, <laughs> there's something in that. We'll, we'll carry that for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for any young Indigenous artist, singer, opera singer, or songwriter, what that needs to hear something from you, what would you say to them? right now in this bizarre moment that we're all kind of living through. Is there any nugget of wisdom that you've learned? Um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm i frequently asked to give advice to young songwriters or young Indigenous artists. And, um, and I think what this time has really taught me is that I do love music and that I um, and that I find comfort and healing in it and you know excitement self-expression um, all of those really good things and that it can be it can be a tool to um, to heal yourself or to express yourself or to and as musicians you know, that's a really good baseline check is that if you're a young musician and what you're focused on is getting notoriety, um, then music is probably not for you as a career. Although music is really for everybody. Um, I, you know, I, I just love watching people grow and, and develop through music. And, um, but at this time, like, it's a good time to kind of check in with yourself and and really develop your relationship with music it's a weird thing to say because it's not a person but it kind of like I've broken up with music three times in my life um, and and if this you know if being alone not alone but if being at home and not able to tour and 
all of that has taught me. I think it's that I'm, I'm just as charged up about music as I was, um, you know, when I started this whole gambit, like 40 years ago. So, <laughs> so it's really, um, yeah, I, I guess my, my advice is to really, really just lean on the music is what I, what I want to say. I think as a young indigenous artist, it's important not to focus too much on like I'm gonna have success because I think we should be reinventing measures of success yeah um, I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on like financial success awards um, those kind of competitive mm -hmm. things but that's not those are not important in an indigenous worldview I mean wealth is important but wealth doesn't just mean money. Um, you know, you to live a rich life, you need community, you need, um, you know, those things around you to support you like the land and the water and your family, your friends, like those kind of things. So so redefining those measures of success to me is, is central in kind of um, furthering Indigenous art. And um, and looking at it from a new perspective. So if you're a young artist coming up, um, maybe the important thing is not um, reaching a million people or getting like a like thousands of spins on Spotify. Maybe it's that you actually played a show for your grandmother and her friends and they like loved you. Or like maybe you learned something, you know, um, from another person in your community that you can maybe you learned a traditional song and you can sing that and honor them or you know something something i'm i'm learning right now i i actually um and i challenged myself and then uh i dreamed up this project and then i actually got the money to do it and now i'm like standing on this <laughs> on the <laughs> edge and uh i've challenged myself to write an entire album in, in Dene, in Dene K, in wow. my language, which I've never done before. And, uh, and it's super scary because I don't speak my language, but, um, but super challenging. And I'm really excited to do that. So challenging yourself and, and pushing yourself in, in ways that you're, um, that you feel uncomfortable with is important as an artist. And that's another little piece of advice. You were like an educator, um, a teacher, <laughs> but yet you're always being open to learn as well. And that's that's I that's a huge sort of wise trait as well. And you're a damn good songwriter on top of that. So um, thank you. <laughs> I'm so fortunate to know you, and so th thank you so much for being who you are. Your spirit is so pure, and that comes across. Um, in your music and who you are. So thank you, Leela, and keep being who you are because that's perfect. Thanks, Joel. It's it's such a pleasure to talk to you, and I've really enjoyed watching some of your other sessions with the Against the Grain uh, chats. Against the Grain TV, is that what you yeah, call it? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you have a wonderful community, and, um, and I really i am honored to be a part of it. So yeah, let's keep in touch. And uh, when when we can all uh, be together again, let's put on an Indigenous opera tour. I love that. That sounds awesome. So I'll, you know me, I'll try my best to make it happen. <laughs> and Debbie's okay, been so. following for years to have that happen as well. So yes. And <laughs> Bruce said thanks to both of us. So thank you, Bruce, Bruce for tuning in. Um, Leela, we'll see you sometime soon, hopefully. But thanks again for doing this for us. Okay. Take care, Joel. Masi. Thank you. Um, yes, an Indigenous operator. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and uh, it coming up one week today, we go back to our Opera Pub series, and we will be coming to you live from Berlin in Germany, where we feature an incredible soprano. Her name is Rachel Fenlin. And it's called Fenlin and Fenlin. Why? Because she is a soprano, but also a pianist. And she does it both at the same time. And it's not just kind of like song. She does opera. She does 
art song. She does it all. It's kind of amazing what she does. And so please come in and tune in one week today to hear Rachel. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.